You know, you, you hate to see anybody abused or pushed around, but when you're looking and you're seeing the, the, the portrayal of Jesus being, having all that hard stuff done to him, it just breaks my heart. And, and it probably does yours too. So I didn't, but, but God showed me some really cool stuff in here that I think is just super, super powerful. And um, we're going to get to that uh, today, hopefully, maybe, whatever he has in mind. And um, I, I really think that uh, our service is going to end a little differently today. For those of you who've I haven't been here in a while, or uh, this is your first time, you're thinking, what could that be like? Who knows? So just hang in there. Um, uh, it'll be exciting, I promise. So we are in John chapter 18, uh, verses uh, 12 through 40, if we make it that far. Um, last week, we got Jesus through the Kidron Valley. Remember, yea, though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, Kidron Valley was that valley where all of the, uh, the blood of the sacrifices from all those uh, 20,000 to 200,000 lambs would run down. That was how Rome would, would cleanse the, the temple and the city of that blood. And, and it had been stained over the, over the years and years and years of sacrifice. And Jesus literally takes his men across that as he goes into the garden. I think that's a huge picture of what Jesus is fixing to do for you and for me. He's fixing to be the, fixing, if you're not from around here, fixing means he's about to. He's fixing to fix us as only he can fix us. And uh, he is the, the final sacrifice. Now, um, in the garden then, um, uh, 200 to 600 armed soldiers come to arrest Jesus. Um, they come in, and uh, uh, when they say, uh, Jesus asks, who are you looking for? Uh, they say, well, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth because they really weren't sure which, which one he was. Judas was going to betray him with a kiss. But before he even had an opportunity to do that, Jesus says, I am. It doesn't say, I am he, the one you're seeking. He says, I am. He had said, I am the, the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I am, I am, I am. And not the first time that these people had heard the word I am uh, in the context of God. So Peter, um, Peter being Peter, tries to save the, save the day. Um, so he hits the first person he comes to. I don't think he was aiming for uh, Malchus's ear. I think he was aiming for his head and or his neck, and his aim was a little off. He cut his ear off, and Jesus says, stop, Peter. Um, we'll look at that a little bit later, but, but, but stop, Peter. He puts the ear back on there, and uh, all this stuff is going on. And... Um, <clears throat> the religious leaders, <clears throat> excuse me, the religious leaders had a plan. Their plan was, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get this Jesus guy who's messing up our sandbox, we're going to get rid of him so that we can go back to having control over people's spiritual lives. Because we're in control of people's spiritual lives. What they didn't realize is that then getting, in getting rid of Jesus, they took control of the people's spiritual lives out of their hands and put them in the hands that they belonged in, and that was the nail-pierced hands of Jesus Christ. They were part of the plan. They didn't think they were part of the plan, but they were part of the plan of redemption. And isn't it amazing that God can use anybody, anytime, anywhere, in any way to make his plans come? So, if you're worried about who's going to be the, the next president or king of the United States, don't worry about it. God is in control. He has way more power than we can even think or imagine. Okay, so it's all good. I'm not saying don't vote. I'm saying vote, but, you know, don't worry about it. Vote and then go home and read your Bible and it's all going to be good. So they don't really understand that there's a plan here that's been set in motion before the foundation of the earth. Okay, now, that's a pretty long time ago. So this has been a plan that was worked out to perfection and was implemented before the foundation of the earth. So that's pretty cool. So we're going to start in John chapter 18. We're going to back up and just start it at verse 12. Uh, again, those two questions. What is truth? Um, how many of you all believe that you can find truth on the Internet? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said, you cannot trust everything on the Internet. I read that yesterday on the Internet. We, we don't know. We, we've gotten to the point where we've got so much information out there. We have no idea what's truth and what's not truth. Even, even I think, I know that sometimes I look at the political candidates and they, and they make me mad because it's like, do you, you know, okay, lie to me, but don't think I'm stupid enough to believe your lie. That's even more insulting that you lied to me. You think I actually believe what you're saying. But I, I kind of pity people in, in that profession sometimes. 
I don't think they know the truth anymore. I think they've been living under a false uh, presumption of their abilities and their talents and their, and their uh, you know, what, what a gift they are to the world that they actually no longer can see the truth either. But we know who the truth is. The truth is the Spirit of the living God who lives inside of us. So we have the source of truth inside of us so we can better interpret the things that we have been, we're being told by, uh, by the world and by the media. But the second question is, to me, is even more important because it, it goes back to the, what is truth. Is Jesus enough? Now, for most of us, we would immediately say, absolutely. So, when I say that all you need is Jesus, if you begin to go, well, now, but you also have to live right. Well, but you also, but you also, if you put in, but you also, then you really don't believe Jesus is enough. And let me tell you, Jesus is enough. Well, don't you have to? No, you get to. When Jesus is enough, he begins to bring about in you a better life, a more righteous life. What we try to do is get righteous so that we can get saved. You get saved so that you can get righteous. You get cleaned up so that you can be related to Jesus. No, you get related to Jesus so that he can clean you up. It's, it's, all, it's all one of those things where, and all, you know, the accusation, well, you just believe you can do whatever you want to do. Yes, but I also believe that my want to has changed because now I have the mind of Christ. I, ha- I have the Holy Spirit living inside me going, dude, that, you don't want to do that. You want to do this over. You want what's, this is what God has for you that's best. Go, take door number one. Don't go to door number two because that's what the world wants. Over there, you go through that door. Guess what's on the other side of that door? Shame, guilt, remorse, um, a, a disconnect with in your relationship, in your um, ongoing relationship with the Lord. In door number one, there's none of that stuff. In door number one, there's the righteousness of Christ. There's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And so you want to always choose that. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. So That was kind of a long introduction, but here we go. John chapter 18, verse 12 and 13 says, Then the detachment of soldiers uh, with its commanders and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, uh, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Of course, now it's no coincidence. I said this last last week. The, the the, The Roman government would put in position whoever they wanted to in the religious leaders, um, in the position of religious leading. Now, if you go back and you study the Roman Catholic Church early on, um, that, that was, that they, they followed the same thing. I mean, it was, it, it just can kind of perpetuated and perpetuated and perpetuated. We want to have, we want to know who uh, the, the, the Pope or whatever, and I'm, I'm not getting political about the Pope now, but the Pope back then, um, we want to know that we can help, he's going to help us keep the people in line, and there are a lot of people who are going to follow him, so we're going to make sure that we have a say-so in who the Pope is. They were doing the same thing even before that in, in Rome, and so they had, they had put this guy in there, and um, he was related to somebody who was related to somebody, and Quirinius put him in the political appointment, um, the ultimate in uh, uh, where you should have had separation of church and state. When, when we read about separation of church and state, this is what our founding fathers were talking about. This should not happen where the government appoints the religious leaders. That's what, okay, so if anybody tells you that means a preacher can't say anything about politics, that's not exactly what it means. So verse 14, Caiaphas was one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. And remember when we read that, and he didn't come up with that on his own. <laughs> he was right. It's better that, that Jesus guy dies so we can go back, he was thinking, so we can go back to being in charge. But in in reality, it's better for Jesus to die so that all can be saved. Because sin entered into the world through one man, and it's going to exit the world through one man, and that man is Jesus. So verse 15 and 16 says, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who uh, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. 
And I think commonly we assume that that's John, John the beloved disciple, John the disciple who Jesus loved. And for those of you who haven't heard me say this, um, I used to think that when John said the disciple whom Jesus loved, that it was kind of his way of sticking his chest out going, he loved me. Peter he tolerated, but he loved me. I've since come to realize that it wasn't that at all. I think, I think John, just figured, John just finally got, Jesus loves me. Man, if I'm going to go by any name at all, it's going to be Jesus loves me. What's your name? Jesus loves me. No, really, what's your name? Jesus loves me. That, that's all I want you to know about me is that Jesus loves me. I think that was when John says the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think it was just because he just was blown away by the fact that Jesus loved him. I would that all of us are that blown away by the fact that Jesus loves me. What's going on in your life? Oh, man, Jesus loves me. What, no, really, what's, what's, tell, me all the, tell me all the junk in your life. Okay, wait, Jesus loves me. I just want to start with that. And um, one of the songs, that, the last song that I sang um, uh, for this, uh, this group that I sang at in, in Florida, one lady called out, she just, she just wanted us to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And, you know, a lot of us learned that when we were little kids. You should still be singing it as an adult. Jesus loves me. And he loves you too. So, um, verse, uh, verse 17 says, uh, You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. So, denial number one. What did Peter say? Jesus, if all of these, if all these other scallywags run off, I'm not going to go anywhere. I got my sword, I got my attitude, I am, I am here for you. And let's give, him, let's give him some props. I mean, he's the one who pulled the sword out and tried to defend Jesus. Of course, Jesus is like, dude, we, we're going to realize Jesus, not in, not in John, but in, in Matthew, Jesus looks at him and he goes, dude, if I, wanted 12, 000, if I wanted 12 legions of angels here, they'd be here. So put your sword away. Peter, nice try but it's okay. It's, this has got to happen. So, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Now, I want to say this. We know that at some point in, in this next few verses, we know that at some point um, Peter is going to deny Jesus that third time. He's going to hear that cock crow, and we'll talk about what that could actually mean. Um, but he's going to turn and look at Jesus, and Jesus is going to turn and look at him. Now, when we think about that, how many of y'all kind of were raised to believe when Jesus looked over at Peter, he looked over and like, you dirty dog, you scoundrel. See, I told you. I told you you weren't going to make it. I think when Jesus looked at Peter, his heart was broken for Peter, not because of Peter. Peter didn't break his heart when he denied him that third time. What broke his heart was Jesus was thinking, oh, Peter, man, man, you're... You just went someplace you never intended to go, and now you're thinking, I've denied, I've denied Jesus. What a, what a scum I am. What a skunk I am. Look, I did exactly what he said I was going to do. I was, I was brave. I, was, I, was, I came in here, and I, I've just blown it. Jesus was heartbroken over that, but not because of Peter. He was heartbroken for Peter. When you and I mess up, when we, when we drift back, when we go back and, and that thing that was so comfortable when we were not saved, we kind of try it, we go back and we touch it again, we put it back on, we wear it for a little while. What do we do? We look, oh man, we, I just broke Jesus' heart. Yes, because he knows your heart broken over returning to something that he doesn't want you to go back to. He's not heartbroken because you messed up. He's heartbroken because you're heartbroken that you messed up. See, that's totally different. That's totally different than, than you thinking that Jesus is sitting over there going, man, you have broken my heart one more time. I didn't know you were going to do that. Actually, he didn't know you were going to do that. That's what happens when you're an all-knowing God. You know everything that's going to come. You know everything that's going to happen, every good and bad thing that's going to happen. So back to, back to verse uh, 17, denial number one. Hey, aren't you one of the, uh, aren't you one of the disciples? No, no, no. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Well, it was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire uh, they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. 
Now, <clears throat> has anybody else ever figured out that when you're cold and alone, that is the best time to be tempted to do something you don't need to be doing? When you're lonely and you're cold. You're lonely and you're cold, and so just it's like, uh, you know, what should we do when we're lonely and we're cold? Well, I just want to throw out there, that's a good time to just